Well, thank you, Carlos. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be here at, uh, you know, the home place of Kelly Johnson, who is, uh, is, is obviously a hero of mine and of a lot of folks in, this, uh, in the industry. And um, it's, it's uh, somebody who uh, I think has inspired a lot of us who started his career um, right here in Ann Arbor. So how many of you are members of the AIAA? Let's see. Okay, so maybe half, a little more than half. Um, well, I hope maybe the rest of you can, will go out and join the AIAA after this. We'll kind of circle back to that. But one of the themes that I kind of wanted to talk about here is this whole idea of where unmanned aviation is going. And to do that, it's good to kind of start with a little bit of where have we come from. But it's obviously one of the really exciting places to be in, in aerospace. And the AIAA, as the sort of organization of aerospace professionals, provides the continuity to all of us as, as practicing technical profession, professionals throughout our career. So you may work for a lot of different companies over the, year, the course of your career, but you'll probably belong to one uh, professional organization. And uh, I've been in the AAA since I joined as a student at MIT in 1977. So, um, so the, the whole man versus unman is a little bit of a, of a false contrast, but uh, let's, let me start by looking at this. I mean, this, we passed a big milestone earlier this year where the FAA finally began to sort of recognize these, uh, I call them robotic airplanes, people call them drones, UAVs, UASs. But if you kind of look at the history of the issuing of pilot's licenses in this country over the last, uh, the last 40 years, it's been a steady downward trend. That's the, uh, if you add in transport licenses and student licenses, same trend, a little bit higher numbers. Um, but despite the incredible growth in commercial aviation, which worldwide, you know, pretty much tracks GDP growth, the number of people becoming pilots in the United States has declined steadily. And that's despite, in general aviation, a lot of advances in composite structures, glass cockpits, uh, parachutes, uh, you know, the whole movement to try to revitalize general aviation and increase the number of people flying in the United States has largely failed and you have to, and the, the accident rate has largely been unchanged during that period despite a lot of work. And you kind of have to ask yourself, a lot of people ask themselves, why is this and what do we need to do to, uh, to change that? And then at the other end, you kind of, the FAA has begun to register drone operators and I, I realize that most of these drone operators are at one, at, from one point of view, a little more than glorified model airplanes, but at another point of view, the sensors, the, the algorithms, the perception systems, the software that is flying the small quad rotors is uh, very similar to what can fly much larger vehicles. But I think what you've seen here, in, and this, this data is a few months old, so it's, it's already uh, changed dramatically, is the rap as soon as they began to register the drone operators, and now they've released part 107, so they're beginning to, to issue a certificate for this, that you see the number of people almost instantly passing the number of licensed pilots. And that trend is going to continue, and that trend is going to expand beyond just the small UASs to encompass all of aviation. And all of you in this room are going to be uh, should you choose, are going to be a big part of this transformation because I don't think that's going to, to turn around and, uh, and go back. So the central thesis that we hold at Aurora is not that the rise of the robotic systems will decrease the number of pilots, but in fact the rise of robotic systems is key to revitalizing general aviation and other parts of, of the uh, aviation spectrum and will drive a lot of growth in the future. So, that's the, the sort of overall picture. As we talk a little bit more about it, one of the characteristics of our, of the, that makes the uh, discussion of drones confusing is you can get a whole range. So that, you know, $30 uh, uh, micro system is a drone. Uh, the most famous ones are sort of the Phantom series of, uh, those are drones. 
Um, that's the Predator, those are drones, and that's uh, Aurora's Orion, which holds the world endurance record for UASs in that weight class, and that's a drone. And so obviously, when you, you know, you're talking about an incredibly broad range of, of vehicles when you see the word drone in the paper or in the media, and I think we have to start by being careful about what we're talking about in the exact systems when we talk about, about drones. The lineage of the drone industry, this is really a, a, rough, uh, <laughs> a rough draft that I, I put together for this presentation, which needs to be refined. But my, my basic point on this is that if you go back and sort of trace the intellectual DNA of ideas, of systems that are out there, it's kind of a fun exercise. Where did ideas come from? Who pushed them? Where did they first get reduced to practice? A lot of the work in the current drone business that has been deployed, the stuff that's operationally deployed around the world, really has a pretty concentrated uh, DNA train, okay, that goes back to the uh, Ryan uh, Aeronautical, the whole Teledyne, the Northrop Grumman access that um, really brought, um, you know, the, the United States had used the, has used these drones in, in each of the, the major wars in the 20th century. They sort of reached their modern instantiation in Vietnam, but then they faded out very quickly from the U.S. military in the early 70s. They were picked up by the Israelis, who became the world leader uh, in about the 70s, and I think, and, and continue to lead many parts of the industry. And then some interesting feedback loops where uh, leading systems, which became General Atomics, which invented the Predator. Uh, if you kind of track the major systems that are out there that are deployed, there's only a few threads. Now, in the, in the, in the modern, I, I put um, our own, my own sort of family tree on here just because I think that that's interesting. I don't, don't mean to imply it's in the same status as some of those, but just to say that you know, aerovironment is sort of a, a the McCready uh, thrust is a different uh, is a different uh, track that really brought in sort of the lineage of these human-powered airplanes, very low, slow, highly efficient. Um, our own work at Aurora and and Carlos mentioned uh, Rockwell and and then things like the the Aerosond was designed at Aurora and then Tad McGear uh, left Aurora and started in situ. That became uh, that became was spun off to, Aeros the Aerosan was sold to Textron, the in situ became the Scan Eagle, is it Boeing? When you actually trace back these, there's fairly limited threads of DNA, but then you get into this century and um, you see this incredible explosion both in new companies and in uh, new investment, a lot of venture capital coming into the area. And a lot of that with the rise of DJI. I mean, the most successful UAV company of the last decade is clearly DJI, which went from a grad student in about 2006 to a company with, it's hard to know exactly, but a market cap certainly somewhere up around uh, a billion or so. You know, the military revolution, I think, really can be traced back to 9-11, the modern military revolution of, of, of UASs. Uh, when we started Aurora in 89, you had to explain to people what a UAV was, what a drone was, what, what was the idea of this. And you don't have to do that anymore, right? I mean, you can't pick up a newspaper or, or any kind of media today without having some reference to drones. Not all good, uh, but, but drones are very much in the, in the popular eye. It's because of what happened here. This is flight hours over time. And during, you know, <laughs> up until about 2001, the total flight time in the unmanned space was measured in a few hundred or a few thousand hours per year. In 1999, uh, one company had more flight time than everybody else put together. That company was Israel Aircraft Industries, and that number was 100,000 flight hours over, you know, their entire portfolio of flying. After 9-11, um, the, the use of these platforms went essentially exponential. Uh, much of that, the Predator, the Global Hawk, a few other systems in there. And you can kind of see a classic S-curve in here where it starts out low, 
for a long time, there's a trigger event, it goes exponential, it's sort of in this sort of the classic S curve, where it's really kind of, it came down a little here, depends if you count the small stuff, the ravens, the pumas, the scan eagles, you get up to about a million hours a year of flying, okay? So the kind of curve that's in every business plan ever written and that rarely actually comes to, to pass occurred here in the military side of unmanned airplanes. Um, following very much Clay Christensen's classic theory of, of what disruptive innovation looks like. Most of that was due to this guy, Abe Karam, um, who, uh, who grew up in Israel, came to the United States in the late, uh, the late 70s, has started several companies or, um, uh, and participated in the starting of, of several others. In the, in the 1980s, Abe had a company called Leading Systems and with the support of DARPA, they developed a long endurance airplane called the Amber. And uh, the Amber was very successful in setting a number of UAV records, but it was unable to make that breakthrough from a DARPA type R&D project into a mainline military system. Abe had the vision, and I remember uh, as, a, as, as someone coming out of school, um, I, I almost went to work for Leading Systems, and Abe, as part of that process, explained in amazing detail pretty much exactly what has come to pass, right? He didn't know the time, and the events were such that he didn't actually uh, participate in some of those because he was no longer associated with General Atomics by the time this all occurred, but he was the visionary. I, I put him in the, in the class of people like Tesla, the original Tesla, right? They, the guys who have the big, big dreams in, in this, and he saw the future uh, very accurately, not necessarily how that transition path, but, but, um, but, but what was coming in terms of the, the way these things would impact the military side. The commercial revolution, I think, really traces to December 2013. And that's the day that Jeff Bezos goes on 60 Minutes with Morley Safer there and says, hey, I'm going to start delivering packages by, uh, with small drones as soon as the FAA lets me because it's ready to go. Okay, 2013, it's now 2016. See how many packages you get this Christmas by drone. But whether that was just you know, Black Monday marketing hype or not, I think this was of lasting importance because what it did was it moved the public perception from, of drones as these killing machines that were very effective downrange but which you didn't really want in your backyard. You know, the idea that the Michigan State Patrol might get a fleet of predators is not something that most people would probably go, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, what, what Amazon has done is moved the idea that drones can have real productive uses as part of civil, you know, commercial society and made and popularized that idea. And that is, uh, it, often it's the mindset as much as anything else. The guy who's made this happen, okay, uh, to, to date is, uh, is probably less well known than, than even Abe Karam. This is Frank Wang. He's a, he was a grad student a decade ago in China who with several colleagues started DJI and they have largely driven what has happened here in the consumer UAS space, not flight hours here because there's no central compilation of how many flight hours these things are flying. Um, but about 2010, it's essentially zero. It's the hardcore model airplaners like probably a lot of us in this room, but not the general population. And then boom, and I, you know, I need to update this chart as well, but it's, these are millions of shipments uh, you know, per year. Just an amazing number of, uh, of UASs. And so you, you kind of ask yourself, why is that? Now, most of the people in this room probably get it, but you know, my theory is that all you have to, most of these are being used for, uh, as, as my son called it, a 300 foot long selfie stick, right? Where you are taking pictures and vicariously seeing the world that we live in, it's still the, it's very familiar, it's our world. It's not like getting in an airliner where you're at 30,000 feet, you're looking down. Yeah, it's sort of recognizable, but it's not the space you're used to living in. You know, the small drones, 
they're in the space you're living in. They're just giving you a different perspective that you couldn't do, uh, that you can't get on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And they are so easy to operate that the barrier has completely come down, much akin to uh, the cell phone, the smartphones, where they don't even come with an instruction manual anymore, um, and everybody can use them. The same thing has happened, and that's the power of the robotics in this case, and that, that's gonna be, that's gonna continue. I, I threw this in just because this is some footage that I shot. Um, Carlos mentioned the Daedalus Project in June. I went back for the first time since 1988 to Crete, where they're still honoring Canelos Canelopoulos, the pilot, and the, and the flight. But this is one of the places we looked at, and we backpacked into this, and I carried a drone with me, and I flew the drone around. And it's just an example of the kind of thing that would have been hard and expensive even five years ago to get something like this. You'd need a helicopter. And actually, in Daedalus, when we did this, we did have a helicopter, but it was provided by the Greek Air Force and loaned to us. And here you can just carry it in a small backpack and go to remote places of the globe and get amazing video and anybody can do it and that is one of the powers of the technology. Now it's also one of the the challenges of this because you know another important milestone in this was um, the uh, the episode uh, a year a uh, year and a half ago now where a, uh, a phantom landed on the White House lawn and you, there's lots of stories about exactly how that came to pass, but let me just say that it got the attention of a lot of people in Washington and, uh, and has, uh, has marked kind of another stage in this as people really focus into the idea that, wow, um, these things could have some nefarious purposes put into, uh, into the wrong hands. And in fact, there, there are lots of issues that go along with this. I mean, obviously, Safety, there's no passengers on board these things. I say yet, because if you looked at the Consumer Electronics Show or what Ehang or a Volocopter are doing, there's talk about that. Just scale it up and put a person in it. Um, but there are certainly risks to persons and property on the ground. There's risks to other airplanes. Enormous privacy issues in this. We're relitigating you know, property rights that were settled 100 years ago that had to be, were sort of brought up the first time people started to fly, and the idea of what is navigable airspace, and so it kind of evolved to 1,000 feet and above with sort of public airspace, and over your house, you didn't really expect people to be flying in your front yard, your front yard to be navigable airspace, but now maybe it is, and that's being, being, being relitigated. Obviously, uh, strong ethics in uh, debates in this, um, uh, you know, several recent Hollywood films and plays have begun to address some of, some of these. And then, of course, the idea of, of criminal or terrorist activity, which is something that, that the White House um, in, intrusion really set off. One of the things I like to point out to people who are focused on the aircraft issue is that there, there are a lot of collisions with UAVs already in the airspace. First of all, there's rounded out, this is some George Mason data, but about about 10 billion birds in the national airspace system at any given time, okay? That's a big number. About 10,000 strikes per year are reported between biologically-based UAVs and uh, manned aircraft. About 1,000 of those result in some kind of damage to the airplane. I suspect a higher percentage result in damage to the bird, but the, what the FAA is tracking is damage to the airplane. And averaged over the last 30 years, it comes out to be about 10 injuries or fatalities a year. Um, and, uh, you know, just to kind of put that in, 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 in context. The uh, two books that I highly recommend if you haven't looked at this, if you haven't had a chance to look at them, that kind of step back and talk about the, where are we going with robotics and humans. Uh, one is Mendel's book and one is Markov's book um, that are not technical treaties per se, but they give a good sense of how humans and robots interact for the benefit of each of them. And so that a lot of the popular conception we have of what robots do or how they work with people 
aren't really true, right? And, and typically what happens when the robotics start to come in, people are very alarmed that the humans are going to get replaced. And so you get into these competitive situations. Mendel talks a lot about undersea exploration, using robots uh, in things like the exploration, finding the Titanic and stuff like that. And the, the, at first they were two stovepiped communities, the manned submersibles and the robotic submersibles. And then as they began to be used, they came together into a system that was more effective, way more effective than either one had been before. And he postulates that that's really the real way that robotics get integrated in and, and that that's how it's going to work in other, and it's already working in, in aviation uh, fields. The whole point here is that the issue is not about manned versus unmanned and a polarization of that. It's about this spectrum from, uh, of increasing autonomy from things where there is no autonomy in the system, no uh, high level of automation up to systems that are fully autonomous, and the fact that humans are always involved, it's just where they are in the, uh, in the system, and that these things drive quickly to things that benefit uh, both sides. So why, kind of what's, what's, where are we headed next in this? Um, well, the, uh, there's a number of tech companies that are pushing uh, basically a UAS service model, right, where um, you get some data service or cargo delivery service or eventually passenger delivery service from these things, but you don't actually buy and own and operate the airplane yourself pretty familiar uh, business model. Um, these are numbers that Google and Facebook have put out about what they think the, uh, uh, the market for communications relay, internet service providing, their theory being there are seven billion people approximately in the world today, about two billion of them have access to high-speed internet. The other five billion are potential customers, and so how do they get the, the, uh, the internet to there? And they're exploring everything, ground-based fiber towers, satellites, balloons, um, and long-endurance uh, airplanes. And the real point of this chart is not that this is a for sure thing, but if you look at the numbers and then you look back at that military number of the military flying is down here at a million flight hours a year, these kind of numbers that they're talking about drive you to like 100 million um, uh, flight hours a year. And at first you go, that is insane, right? That's crazy. That is way outside anything we are used to as aeronautical engineers who've grown up in the modern era, right? And then you start to go, well, okay, but how much flying do people do today? And so we do about a million hours a year of UAV flying. And I think we do, you know, on the order of the uh, 100 million flight hours a year as a species, if you add up commercial flying, military, general aviation, all of that, you get about 100 million hours a year-ish. And so these guys are talking about doubling the amount of flying that humanity does. And in Silicon Valley, a factor of two is nothing, right? I mean, this is a, a, um, a world that is, that is, that is used to to uh, much more dramatic uh, progressions of Moore's Law type of, of mentality. Um, so these become not quite as crazy as they look at, at, uh, at the first thing. And I've learned, uh, you know, to take some of these things fairly seriously. I, I think that this kind of chart should be of great interest to everybody in the room because this is the future of a lot of aviation is driven by Applications that look like this. Now, maybe the internet and the sky application, maybe that works out or maybe it doesn't. I'll show you some numbers in a second on that. But one of these is going to hit. And so you can see that we're looking at very dramatic increases in, in the amount of flying that's done by the introduction of these, of these robots. So it's a great time to be in the industry. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, you know, one of the key things about what gets done and what doesn't get done, it comes back to, to money. It's like the, the Watergate investing. Follow the money, right? And so, so a lot of this you kind of have to look at. Um, this is a, a top-level summary of a financial uh, a model that we've developed at Aurora that looks at all the different pieces that go into a system calculation of, of what makes sense. 
And I wanted to just kind of show a couple of different approaches, right? If you look at the Air Force today operating manned airplanes, those things are typically, ballpark again, I'm rounding to the, the nearest exponent, right? A hundred million bucks. Um, the utilization of those things, incredibly low. They sit around on the ground most of the time. They have a pretty long service life and, the, and they, get, they stay around for a long time. Lots of maintenance and the operations and a lot of people, um, particularly the way the, uh, the Air Force and the Army have chosen to, uh, to, use, to, to embed these systems into the services, it's pretty labor intensive. Okay, the second model is UAVs today and COCO is company owned, company operated. Essentially if private operation of today's UAV technology. So Predators, Orions, that kind of class. You know, these are in the order of $10 million airplanes. Um, they get utilized more than, than, uh, uh, than, than military manned airplanes. Um, they don't last as long. They, uh, uh, they have, uh, you know, they still require a fair amount of maintenance um, and the operations staffing is a lot smaller. I'm ignoring the data analysis side, but the operations side is smaller, but still not what you need because these, you know, these things boil out to flight hour costs of tens of thousands of dollars an hour. These are thousands of dollars an hour. To make these visions happen, you need tens of dollars an hour, right? And so to do that, you have to drive the costs down to a couple of million a unit, maybe ideally less than a million. The utilization has to go way up. The lifetime has to go way up. And the staffing picture has to change very dramatically. And so is that, is that possible? Is the, are the physics behind this? And the answer is, yeah, actually it probably is. I mean, you have to buy into some of these kinds of numbers. And again, take all these with a grain of salt. These are not proprietary numbers and um, they're, they're only accurate to, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I could say the exponent on there, but, but the kinds of things here's like, okay, about 40,000. So tens of thousands of dollars an hour for that. The UAVs can do thousands of hours, dollars an hour. And you really want to get down to tens of dollars an hour to make those, if you're competing with a, with a cell tower or something like that. And there's a lot of work to be done, but it's not beyond the possible to have these visions um, come through. It's harder than a lot of people thought, as you kind of, if you kind of look at the experience today that both Google and Facebook have had in trying to build and fly long endurance solar airplanes, but they're not impossible. So when, we, when I look at this, I kind of boil down to two things that absolutely have to happen for large-scale commercial uh, operations. And, and so this is kind of, you know, to the department here. Two things that, what do we need as, in, as an industry? We need reliable, affordable, detect, see, and avoid. We have a, uh, today, the limit on our operations is the ability for these airplanes to identify and avoid non-cooperative traffic and to operate in scenarios where there is non-cooperative traffic. And even today, if you listen to, to Gur Kimchi or Dave Voss on their lectures and you listen carefully, most of their concept of operations assumes that everybody in this low altitude space is going to be a cooperative target. And I personally am not convinced the FAA is ever going to buy into that, that, that you are going to have to deal with the non-cooperative target uh, problem. And so that's one. And the second is, is both a technical and a, a sociological problem. It's to move from the many people per airplane operations to many airplanes per person. And that turns out to be really important because the entire military and the entire civil concept of how aviation is done comes back to this idea of a pilot in command uh, is, that is responsible for that operation of the airplane, it, it's a nautical concept, it goes back to the captain of the ship, right, who, who, is, who is the sole uh, person responsible and whose entire job, while the, the thing is in operation, is to run that. You have to move away from that or those economics will never work, okay, um, to, to move the three orders of magnitude of cost 
right? Dollars per hour, you gotta move from $40,000 an hour to 40. To make that kind of stretch, you have to make this leap, and this is going to be a big deal. The first one is something of a technical problem, although it will have collateral feedback and problems and for the human thing, but this is a real change in the way people think about aviation. And um, I am not completely sure how that transition uh, happens. But those are two, I think those are two foundational things that we don't know how to do today that we have to solve. So I wanted to talk about the other piece of this, which is the, okay, let's go a little further. So right now UAVs move information. They're starting to move cargo, and they definitely will. But, you know, we all grew up going, where's my jet pack? We all thought, you know, the Jetsons went on TV a little over 50 years ago, 1962. Um, and the idea today is if you move around on the scheduled airlines, you can go to about 350 places. You have your choice of a couple of times a day. If you want to fly one, you have to have an air transport rating. And the great thing is they're safe and they're really cheap. I know when you go to buy an airplane ticket, you think, ah, oh, this is, I'm being ripped off. No, you're not. <laughs> it's amazingly inexpensive to fly on a commercial, uh, to buy a ticket on a commercial airliner. General aviation, you know, you can go to more places, 5,000 or so paved runways in the U.S. You can go anytime the weather permits. You can have a range of ratings from light sport um, to commercial, basically, Basically based on how many people besides yourself could you kill if things uh, went wrong. And the problem is it's really expensive. Thousands of dollars an hour and amazing amounts of training in order to do it safely, right? That's the big issue is that the training is required to operate in the NAS and the, most of the training is required to be safe, okay? The stick and rudder part is actually a very minor part of what it takes to be a pilot in the modern um, air transportation system. And what we all want, right, is the ability to go point to point on demand with a driver's license for the price of an airplane ticket. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, that's a vision that is catching on, right? There's a lot of, of uh, debate. Now, I, I postulate it's not quite as close as some people might have you believe. These are all things that within this year, this calendar year, these are all pictures that have been put up. Some of them been working on them for a while, but um, you know, these capture the public eye, the media uh, eye, and are capturing a lot of attention, but a couple of, of uh, comments, and a big one is that it's not just about the airplane, right? Even if you could make any of those work, and uh, you know, Z is a lot of smart people, and they've been working for more than seven years on this problem. Um, even if you had it tomorrow, if Google rolls out the Google plane tomorrow and they're on sale this weekend, you still have to change the system, right? Because airplanes don't just go off and fly around by themselves, especially in places where you want to operate them. Um, so you got you to gotta bring the system along with you. Uh, people are working on that, NextGen and the, uh, the UAV traffic management. People are imagining whole new air traffic control systems. But those are going to end up being pacing on this. And so where we have been driven at Aurora is into this idea of an optionally piloted airplane that can kind of bridge between the UAV system and the, um, and the air traffic control system. So this is a video of an Aurora airplane and it starts with the pilot getting out of the airplane. The flight is about to begin, that's the pilot, he just walked off the ramp, okay? Um, and from then on, the flight is relatively normal. <laughs> uh, there's a crew chief here, that commands engine start, this is all done, it's done right down the checklist. The airplane is a certified four-place general aviation composite airplane. This one happens to be made in Austria. Um, and there's no occupants on board, and this is in the national airspace system. It is not in any kind of special controlled airspace. This is at Griffiths Air Force Base in upstate New York. It is at one of the FAA test sites, but that's what they are. The test sites are sandboxes, laboratories, for people to do controlled experiments inside the NAS. And 
there is a, the, the operator of this is in the tower, in the FAA tower, and the operator does taxi it with manual control down to the end of the runway, but at the end of the runway, it is fully automatic from there. The command is given to launch and that's it. And the people supervise, what, or people watch what happens, but the airplane is completely on its own. All functions of the takeoff, um, the flight path. Now you can change the flight path with any update frequency that you want as long as you have the uh, high bandwidth uh, uh, controls to it. You can update the flight path, but basically the left seat is a, uh, is there for a human pilot. The right seat is a, there's a robot literally sitting in the right seat of the airplane. And the robot has the capability to do everything in the pilot operating handbook. So every emergency contingency that humans are briefed on, the robot is prepared to handle. Now that's not to say every contingency, right? But every contingency that the pilot is trained in the operating handbook to handle, the Centaur can handle today. So how come you don't see more of these? Well because of that thing I mentioned earlier. The one thing this can't do today is, first of all, it can't tell that there's not a 747 on this runway that it's about to land on. It's going to land there if it's told to land there. And second of all, it can't avoid non-cooperating traffic. If you have transponders, if you have uh, ADSB, sure, these things, uh, the deconflicting is, is relatively straightforward, but, but if you're an airplane out there, or a balloon, or a skydiver, or a sailplane, or a weather balloon, or a large bird, all of which are in the system today, but um, you can't, the system can't avoid those. And so that leaves this in a relatively experimental category where it's good for some things, but it, it's not yet an operational capability because we don't know how to do that. So to make it useful, you know, today these things are used for Reconnaissance, ISR, and COM relay. We use these, we fly these platforms in the, in the NAS um, and we've sold them. Uh, they're used for research and they're used for airspace research. So science research is typically, like we had one up in, green, in, uh, in the north slope of Alaska measuring methane at low altitudes. You know, it's a small market. It's certified in the man mode um, and it has the sort of normal one command station to one airplane model. The next one is you know, air cargo delivery and air taxi, that's a bigger market certified for, but you have to get certified for flight in the NAS. That won't happen until you've f solved the, the detect, see, and avoid problem. And they're probably operated from a fleet dispatch center so that the operators are flying from some centralized location. And then eventually you go to something like a lot of those concepts that you see out there, personal transportation, that market gets very large. That's going to have to be certified for UAV flight in the NAS with passengers. And I think that is still a step uh, far away. Now, even when it's there, you're still going to want a very capable helpline. And so there are going to be network operations centers that can be patched into an airplane in distress. Because remember, these things can handle everything that they've been encountered before, but they still struggle with new stuff, right, that they've never seen before. One of the great things, if you're, a, if you're a pilot and you're being trained as a pilot, you know, a high time human pilot has a few thousand hours, 10, 15,000 hours. That's a lot of flying time for a human. Um, and then the humans retire and you gotta start all over. You gotta train each pilot ab initio. The robotic systems offer the promise of collecting all of the experiences that any of them have had, feed it back into the software, and so now you have systems that are flying with the benefit of literally hundreds of thousands of hours or millions of hours of flight experience in the airplane handling contingencies that have been seen, which is part of how you get away with much, much, much lower amounts of training on the operator side, which is where the money really is. One of the things that, now the other thing you, you need to do <laughs> once you've made the autonomy work is that you need to get rid of the runway or you'd like, you know, to go back to that vision of sort of where's my jetpack. So this is a, a project we're doing at Aurora called the VTOL X-Plane. This is a all electric subscale. This is about the size of what Z has been working on uh, and is quite similar. It's electric, it's battery powered. Uh, it's, this is an all electric airplane. This has 18 fans in the wing and, and uh, six in the canard. 
it's flying today and it has the limitations of any battery powered airplane which is it only flies for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes and um, at first you go that's crazy by the way the idea that it only flies for 20 minutes is one of the reasons Aurora and most other US companies didn't develop the quadrotor right is because we all made the classic mistake of listening to our customer and our customer all said we had airplanes that could do like two hours ducted fans that could fly for two hours a decade ago and the customers all said oh no we don't want two hours we want 10 we want 18 we want 20 and so when the idea of a battery powered versions were suggested they were roundly dismissed for exactly the reasons Clay Christensen cites in his book which is we listened to our customers and so we threw those ideas out and DJI walked right into that market and uh, you can see, see what happened in that. Um, so this is a neat project. It's big, it's, you know, because DARPA, DARPA, -like, DARPA hard sometimes means a really hard technical problem and sometimes it means a problem that has been intentionally made harder than it needs to be just to make it DARPA hard. So this is, what's DARPA hard about this is it's big, okay? The, uh, the, the kind of thing that most of those concepts that people like Z are, that we are working on carry a couple of people and so they are like a thousand pounds gross weight. This is 12,000 pounds so it can in theory carry six or eight people, 400 knots um, at very high aerodynamic efficiencies and, and we're actually building uh, one of these today and it's scheduled to fly in about 18 uh, months or so. And this is not a battery powered airplane, okay? The, the departure that we took in the DARPA program was to move away from batteries, and this uses a gas turbine, actually the same gas, our partner's Rolls-Royce, and it's the same uh, engine that's in the V-22, one of them, and it drives three uh, one megawatt generators, so this airplane has three megawatts on it, enough to power a lot of small towns, and, uh, and that power is distributed electrically to 18 fans in the, embedded in the wing and six in the canard and it, it's a tilt wing, and, um, and that's what allows it to have, uh, I'll call it, you know, real airplane type performance, more than the 10 to 20 minutes that battery powered airplanes do in, I'm tempted to say in our lifetime, but I'll say in this, in this decade, uh, um, and this appears, this hybrid approach appears to be a a compromise. We'll see what the future of that airplane is, but it's, it's pushing a lot of interesting technical frontiers and I'm, I'm sure it will lead to some interesting new concepts. I, I wouldn't promise that they're going to look exactly like that. Okay, so the, the, the wrap up, the summary of this is, is really um, that this is a fantastic time for all of you to be involved in, in aerospace engineering, um, you know, the space side being driven by uh, SpaceX and some of those things, which uh, are building really comparatively simple rockets <laughs> compared to what uh, we, you know, could be done, but they're driving the economies uh, of that, which is neat. Uh, and on the airplane side, it's the stuff we're talking about here, which is the impact of robotics, the marriage of robotics and, and aeronautics together to make a whole class that far from the concern that people have of, oh, these things are going to make the airspace more dangerous, I, I completely disagree. I think they're going to make the airspace much safer. And as an example, when we do figure out the detect, see, and avoid problem, which we will because we have to, um, there will be these minimum operating performance standards that will be put in place. And I predict the humans will not be able to meet those standards. So you're going to get a real challenge where human pilots can't pass the test that the robots have to fly. And the whole airspace thing has been based on this equivalent level of safety concept where, okay, the UAVs have to be at least as good as the manned airplanes. So what happens when the UAVs are better than the manned airplanes, which is not that far away, and um, what are we going to do? And I don't know what we're going to do. Are we going to allow human things to operate at lower levels of performance than the robotics. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, I gave a sort of a version of this talk at, 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 uh, at MIT a year ago, and, um, I, and a lot of these I have a chart for using some of Ella's uh, data from the, um, the US Air 
uh, flight. And, and Michael Collins actually was sitting in the front row. And he asked me, he said, oh, that's all fine. But what about a situation like uh, you know, the U.S. air flight in the, in the Hudson? And, uh, and, I, and I quoted Ellis Pay, and thinking he, you know, he was very proud of this. This is an example of something that proved that humans could never be fully replaced. And I said, actually, research at the University of Michigan <laughs> um, shows that they actually had, had a, an automated trajectory planner of the type that all of our UAVs have. Had that been on board, there was like 20 seconds that you could have accessed runways at LaGuardia and returned and landed on the, the, uh, on the runway. And so not to take anything away from the heroics of, of, uh, of Sullenberger, but, the, but the, the, the robotics actually would have been something that would have been a better outcome had they been on board that, uh, that aircraft. And so, um, you know, we're not there today, but there are a steady progression of things that are being clicked away by one program after another. You know, automated takeoff and landing, the contingency management, the route planning, route planning going into, um, you know, exactly that kind of thing. The landing site selection, uh, programs like ACUS where we're, we're, that are using the same kind of perception systems or similar perception systems to what's going into the driverless cars. Uh, to map out landing sites for VTOL airplanes, um, the collision avoidance, we talked about that, the multiple vehicles supervised by one operator, and then ultimately driving to the economies of scale, because I don't mean in any way to minimize the challenge of getting to three orders of magnitude lower cost than the U.S. Air Force operates today, but it's not as impossible as it sounds when you, you know, dig into it. And, um, and the, what's happened in the last five years in consumer drones, I think, is a harbinger of what's to come across the aviation uh, spectrum. So I don't think there's ever been a better time to you know, be in a place like Michigan and in a department like the aeronautics and the combination of robotics. Um, I think Kelly Johnson would be envious of everybody in this room. So thanks, and I'd be happy to take any, any questions that kind of relate to that. A lot that goes into testing it in environments that are similar to a launch environment. When you have such a violent launch on top of millions of pounds of thrust, mm -hmm. ridiculous vibrations. So we actually have a vibration table in the Space Physics Research Laboratory that allows us to shake.